Good morning. I know exactly how Linda feels. Um, I said I left early this morning and was going to have all the time in the world to review my talk and notes and had a cat throwing up everywhere this morning and a traffic accident out on the main street and so it took me three times longer to get here and late for mass. <laughs> so I know how she feels when she said Satan will put things and obstacles in your way um, when you're trying to do something good. So I totally identify with that. So anyway, um, we look at today and we have studied John. Last week we ended the tomb is empty. Christ has risen. The glorified Christ has appeared to many of his disciples. He has breathed on his apostles the gift of the Holy Spirit. So he clearly seems to end the gospel with chapter 20. He, um, the gospel writer has ended his testament of Jesus of Nazareth so convincingly and so compellingly he has told us that Christ is the Messiah. Christ is the Son of God. He is the Word of God who has come and through his death and resurrection has given us salvation. So chapter 21 seems a little strange. Why would he go on and add one more chapter? The scholars all agree that this chapter was a later edition, <clears throat> probably added by someone in the beloved disciples community, but that there were some very special things that this writer wanted to make known and included in this gospel. One of them was to demonstrate that the uh, reality of the, res the resurrection. There had been very many who had said that the appearance of the risen Christ was nothing more than the visions of the disciples. And there were also other reports that the appearance of Christ were even hallucinations. So the gospel writers all went out of their way to insist that the risen Christ was not a vision, <clears throat> not a hallucination, not a ghost, nor even a spirit, but he is a real and tangible person. That he still has, that he has a real body, which still has the marks in the hands and in the, the, the side where the um, spear was thrust. And so that is one of the main reasons they got, went on. We see another resurrection appearance here in chapter 21. It is proof that, that he has conquered death and that he comes back to his disciples yet again. So as the chapter begins, we find the disciples fishing by the Sea of Tiberias. Fishing venues were often portrayed throughout the Gospels. In the fishing scenes, Jesus calls his disciples at the beginning. He says, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Most of them begin their ministry with Jesus while fishing and they will conclude their uh, ministries in this gospel beside the sea in much the same venue. The word in Greek for fish is ichthus. It has several translations in English. One of the most popular translations is Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. <coughs> and the fish motif became very popular in early Christianity. The followers of Christianity were called Piscuchiles. The root of this Latin word means fish. The fish symbol was simple to draw and it was often used by the Christians as kind of a password to each other. If two people met and they didn't know if each other were Christian, the first person would simply draw an ark much like this in the ground. And if the other person were indeed a Christian, they would finish that ark into the sign of a fish. And that would tell each other that they were indeed Christians. And we still see this very simple symbol in Christianity used even today. But that's the origination. That's where we got it from. 
In our chapter today, Peter is leading the other disciples on a fishing expedition. We know that in John's Gospel there are often two meanings. There is one on the simple meaning on the surface and obvious by the story, but there's also a deeper, hidden and sometimes very spiritual meaning. Today, the deeper and spiritual meaning of Peter leading them is to show that he will lead the apostles and the church in the mission of evangelization. In the book of Acts, chapter 10, Peter has a vision, the same vision three times, in which God communicates to him that the people of all races are now to be included into the church. Not, the church is not just for the Jews. It is to begin with Peter in Jerusalem and to spread out to all people of all nations, and Peter is to head that evangelization. So at daybreak, the risen Christ goes in search of his disciples to encourage them and ultimately to tell them more about the great mission that he is going to entrust to them. He called them to be fishers of men. Yet in the Gospels, you will notice that the disciples never catch anything without the help of the Lord. Early in, in Luke chapter 5, Jesus is in the boat with his disciples fishing, and they are unsuccessful until he tells them to cast their nets into the deeper water, and their nets come up filled with fish. In today's episode, Jesus from the shore tells them to cast their nets on the right side of the boat, and their nets come up filled, overflowing, with 153 kinds of fish. The fathers and doctors of the church have often pondered and written on the meaning of them including 153 fish. There's very many reasons that they've come up with that, what it meant. Two of the reasons they have meant, uh, they have come up with, St. Jerome said that the Greek zoologists had cataloged 153 different kinds of fish and that the catch includes one of every kind of fish, therefore symbolizing the totality and the range of the disciples' catch. So the number symbolizes that through the Christian mission of evangelization, someday men and women from every nation will come together in Christ. St. Augustine gave another ingenious explanation of 153. He said that 10 is the number of the law, the number of commandments, and 7 is the number of grace, it's the number of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. 10 plus 7 is 17. And 153 is the sum of all the figures added up to 17 and stands for 153. I've included that on the handout that I gave you today. There's also very many other um, explanations of 153. Some get really heady and so I didn't put those on there. But whatever the meaning of 153, all these, the conclusion of all these, for the gospel writer of John would have been that 153 is the perfect number and it anticipated the fullness of the church. <clears throat> the beloved disciple is the first to recognize that it is Jesus. Could it be that the beloved disciple remembered that abundant catch earlier in Luke chapter 5? Because it is when he, they draw in those full nets that he recognizes it's Christ and he says, it is the Lord. Saint um, Jose Escavera writes in his book, Friends of God, whereupon the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. Love is far-sighted. Love is the first to appreciate kindness. The adolescent apostle loved Christ with all the purity and tenderness of a heart that had never been corrupted. 
When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his clothes and sprang into the sea. <coughs> Peter personifies the faith, full of marvelous daring. Escavera writes, with a love like John's and a faith like Peter's, what is there that could ever stop us? Jesus shares a meal with the disciples. And when they are finished, he turns to Simon Peter and says, Simon Peter, or Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter answers, yes, Lord, you know I love you. The New Testament was originally written in this, the language of Greek. And in Greek, has several words for, the, uh, for love. But the three most common are philia, eros, and agape, or agape. Uh, agape, whichever you prefer. Philia means friendship. It includes loyalty of friends, family, and community. And it's where we get the name Philadelphia for city of brotherly love. Eros is the passionate and romantic love for someone whom you love more than the philia friendship. Agape means I love you, as in you love your spouse and your children and very dear ones. In Christian love, <clears throat> agape means to love your neighbor as you love yourself. It is self-sacrificing love for one another. So let's look back at the conversation between Christ and Peter. Jesus says, Simon, son of John, do you agape love me? That's the Greek word he uses in the Bible. Do you have self-sacrificing love for me? And Peter answers, yes, Lord, you know that I philia love you. I am very fond and loyal to you. Jesus asks again, Simon, son of John, do you agape love me? And Peter answers a second time, Yes, Lord, you know I philia love you. And then Jesus looks at Peter and says, Simon, son of John, do you philia love me? And Peter responds, Lord, you know everything. You know I philia love you. It's not that Peter doesn't have agape love for Christ, but at the Last Supper, he thought he had agape love and courage when he told Jesus, Lord, I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus looks at him and basically says, Peter, I know you better than you know yourself. I know that you don't have agape love and courage for me. I know you won't lay down your life or die for me. You will kill for me. Remember, it was Peter that had cut off the ear of the man in the Garden of Gethsemane. Yes, Peter, I know you, and you will deny me three times. So this time, Peter doubts himself when Christ asks him. He doesn't want to fail Christ again or make a fool of himself again. So he asks, answers three times. He has philia love for Christ or brotherly love. He is not willing to pledge self-sacrificing love sufficient to lay down his life again. However, Christ knows that Peter is a different and stronger person now. He is now acting with the influence and power of the Holy Spirit. He will indeed go on to lay down his life for the church and for his Lord, Jesus Christ. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit is the difference. And the indwelling of the Holy Spirit should change the life of every Christian to make us more mature followers and allow us to act out of his spirit, not act out of our human spirit. <clears throat> The biblical symbolism, when something is mentioned three times, is as in Christ asking Peter, do you love me three times, is meant to show that God is strengthening and confirming something. Christ is indeed strengthening and confirming Peter. 
to be more than a fisher of men. He is to become the shepherd of Christ's flock, which is our church. A fisherman catches fish, but he does not take care of the fish in the same way that a, a shepherd tends and cares for his sheep. Peter is not assigned this mission because of his special worthiness, because of his failure and denial of Christ three times and then reconciliation and pledging his love. Rather, it is that shows that Christ can work through weakness and failures. He calls the weak and makes them strong. The difference now is that Peter has the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The first call and the last call that Peter will receive from Christ is, follow me. I heard Father Richard Rohr give a talk titled, The Cosmic Christ. In it, he said that many people believe that Christ is Jesus' last name. But, he stated, Jesus is the historical person who came, walked the earth, performed miracles, taught us about the kingdom of God, and died for our sins. The historical Christ is who we have studied this year in Cornerstone. Father Rohr went on to say that Christ is the risen Christ whom the spiritual and the material coexist and is ever expanding to include all people and all of creation. This Christ loves all people, Christians, Muslims, Jews, Hindus, agnostics, and yes, even atheists. He said God created them all and he loves them all. We too must love everyone as a child of God. He said that Christ is the one who we as Christians must fall in love with and the one who we must serve every day. But one of the most profound things that Father Rohr said, at least for me, was that Christ never said, worship me. Christ said, follow me. What he meant was that Christ, as he lived, that we are to live and love as Christ lived and loved. He lived and loved serving everyone, loving everyone. We must not be afraid to proclaim love, the love of Christ to everyone that we come in contact with, everyone that we meet. That's agape love. The person in our time that has most fully exemplified this living and loving, of course, has been Mother Teresa. She once stated that she tries to see that she tried to see the face of Christ in every person that she came in contact with. In her book titled, No Greater Love, she said, When we all see God in each other, we will love one another as he loves us. We will remember to love one another. We must know that we were created for greater things, not just to be a number in this world, not just to go for diplomas and degree degrees from this work to that work. We have been created to love and to be loved. Our works of charity are nothing but the overflow of our love for Christ from within. But for charity to be fruitful, it must cost us. That's sacrificial love. That's agape love. Every day, Christ presents himself in some way to each and every one of us and asks, do you agape love me? Do you have the faith and commitment in your life to give up your life and your personal aspirations to serve me? And how do we most often answer him? Yes, Lord, you know I philia love you. Ask yourself, what will it take for me to totally give myself to Christ so that there is less of me and more of him? What will it take for me to authentically follow him 
and to authentically love him, to agape love him. We all have different levels of faith. We are all on different journeys in our lives, but we all have only one question. Do you agape love Christ? If you do, then follow him. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Gracious and loving God, Father, we come before you this day with hearts full of love, praise. At the end of this beautiful gospel that the writers have given us, our hearts are so, so full of love and knowledge and we wished that you give us the Holy Spirit to go on to every day, plead, pledge our life to you, and that we can see the ways, the very many ways, simple and sometimes complicated that you ask us to serve you. Please give us the courage to stand up and serve you in whatever way that you ask us to. So as we finish the book, we give you all the praise, all the glory, and thank you for calling us to this study. And these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.